Make no illusion, folks. This isn't a set put up by Channel 4. This is bloody real. Four weeks ago, I set out to prove 13 men could survive being abandoned ah. on a remote Pacific island. The pelicans seem to be eating more than I do. This, for me, is a simple experiment to study what makes a man a man. Left alone on the island. Okay. And uh, there you are. They filmed everything themselves. I wanted this to be totally new, totally original, and never done before. 28 days after dropping them off, I returned to the island to find out how my groundbreaking experiment actually worked. That's all you've been drinking. Tastes like you've all been washing your socks. <laughs> and see for myself some of the techniques the men used to survive. When you're pushed to extremes, you realize you can go a lot further than you thought. The men reveal how the experiment affected them. The more things I get rid of in my life, the bigger the smile goes. I think it's powerful to see a group where people are so different, but they're actually bound together by shared experience. And you'll see what happened when they got back to civilization. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so happy. <laughs> I just want to see you. Oh, I missed you. By Christ, I have. <laughs> this island might look like paradise, but if you have a route here with nothing, trust me, it would be hell on earth. I chose to base my experiment on a remote desert island in the Pacific Ocean, more than 5,000 miles from Britain. I think there's something appealing about doing this on an island for a couple of reasons. First of all, is there's nowhere to run. You're stuck on this limited space, and that forces issues. The other reason is that I think people often think of desert islands as nice places. The reality is they're deserted for a reason. There's very little running water, and these things are covered in, in snakes, in tarantulas, and scorpions, you've got crocodiles, uh, you've got sharks, and it, it forces issues because it's an unforgiving, unrelenting environment. But despite the dangers, the men survived. Well, I can see their fire. There he is, boys. Oh, oh, my God. God. Come on. One month after dropping them off, I went back to see for myself what the men had achieved. Well, look at you guys. <laughs> Hairier. Oh, yeah. yeah. Skinnier. <laughs> yeah. But hopefully smarter. Wow, well, congratulations. Yeah. No, mate, thank you. Congratulations. You. Will you show me your camp? Come in. Good. Come, Come in. in. So this is what we call home. And do you often have Tony? That is Tony's spot. <laughs> Good to see you there. Congratulations. Well done, you. Thank you very well much. Well done, you. I love it. I love your throne. So I clocked them all in, I clocked them all out. Safety, security, and I'd like to be the last on the boat to make sure they're all on. <laughs> Shoe stores, obviously. A uh, table kindly made for us by Joe. Hanging machetes, torches, buckets, coconuts. It's good. I mean, this is a real semblance of community. I love that. Look at that. Yeah. You've got a front door. Camp Bassey. Yeah. <laughs> Shirley Island, Camp Bassey. <laughs> so why, why Shirley Island? Uh, because every time we went out looking for food, it was like, surely we're going to find something today. Surely we're going to find something tomorrow. And surely enough, we did. Shirley Island. Genius. In any survival situation, one of the first things you have to do is find shelter. In my opinion, the spot the men chose to set up their camp was pretty good. It was close to the sea, which is a great source of food, and not too far from their water source. But for me, if they'd moved just 10 metres further into the trees, they'd have had better protection from the elements. Custom-made windbreak. <laughs> and when was the wind bad? At night? Night time. It got quite cold, so we built the windbreak to try and ease our suffering. Dean and Ryan, show us where we used to sleep. So some people sleep round here, and then others, like me, Saki, 
sleep here, I get attacked by crabs and frogs every night, which wasn't fun, but it's, it, it's home. If you choose the right place to sleep, you can avoid a whole host of issues. Oh, shit, look at your face. Is it bad? Oh, yeah, it looks pretty bad. From the very beginning of their time on the island, the men were ravaged by insects at night. Anything that's bit me is an arsehole. <laughs> and if you're covered in itchy, painful bites, you're not going to get the rest that you need. What about eight days? Working out what you can do to get a decent night's sleep isn't just a luxury, it's actually about survival. The little things in survival become the big things, and a good night's sleep is right at the top of that list. Wow, look at that, it really goes on. After a few miserable nights, some of the guys realised their mistake. This is the executive lounge. And four of them did move further into the jungle. It's Matt and I were the first to kind of build a couple of these A-frame beds. This is my one here. Um, they're really comfy. Yeah, they're great. They're Try it out if you want. It's, uh, it takes go. me, so it should manage you. Oh, wow, yeah. I would have thought that's an awful lot comfier than lying on the oh, ground, God, yeah. you know? been home for 28 nights and actually gets pretty comfy and you can look at the stars and the canopy. The A-frame beds some of the men built yep. were the perfect way to raise them off the cold, damp floor and out of reach of the critters. Dean's finally found a use for his hairdressing skills. He's <laughs> weaving all the leaves that are sticking through underneath back in beautifully. That is an ant's nest. I've made my bed with an ant's nest. <laughs> Foolish, wasn't it? The men made mattresses using vines, which they covered with woven palm leaves. We're on our way to greater things. It's a shitload better than sleeping on the floor, isn't it? This became known as my fortress of solitude. Oh, my goodness, um, wow. Uh, it's not very dignified. So you really well cocooned in there? I'm pretty well waterproof if the weather had changed. Yeah. Yeah. Warm, dry, off the ground from all the creepy crawlies. Yep. And very happy. Smart thing to have done. I think it's, it's amazing to see how it's evolved and changed. And initially their camp looked a bit like a hobo encampment. Uh, but as the weeks have gone on, they realise that you really need a sanctuary. You need somewhere you can hide away and, and it makes you feel good. And as a reminder of what you love about home, I love the table. Test it so, out. Yeah, I love to test it out. Uh, it's been used pretty much every, every, every. So minute. would you eat meals around here? Yeah. You'd yeah, actually do that. Yep. I mean, if you think of how many British families have stopped sitting around a table and eating together, and there's something incredibly powerful about actually sitting down and looking each other in the eye yeah. and sharing a meal together. So I love the fact that you made table a priority. Looking around the camp, it was obvious how resourceful the men had been with materials they scavenged from around the island. Grab a seat, Bear. Grab a seat. I mean, this is great, isn't it? One thing that staggers me with these desert islands, however remote they are, is just the amount of trash you get washed up on the beaches. <laughs> Guys, that looks like the beginning of a toilet. You would need an enormous arse to... <laughs> to justify a hole like that. It certainly would. Craig, I'm going to be honest with you, mate. This is my ultimate nightmare. It's the closest I've got to a stress ball, to be honest with you. What I've got here is uh, crab pot nut 2.0. This is a sack he's find. What is it? An open beer. You're joking. Yeah, no, I'm full. Oh, shit, you're not. There's so much stuff on the shores of this island of kind of crap and rubbish that normally you kind of look at and tucks and go, oh, what a shame, it's ruining paradise. but. Now we look at every single piece of plastic and metal and string and turn it as kind of treasure. When was the last time you felt salon fresh? What? No way. Shut the fuck up. That is shampoo. <laughs> Dean, promise you share it with me. That is shampoo. Right, you get to let you know. Advanced warning. I've just given Tony a plastic truncheon, so look out. Oh, <laughs> fucking hell. <laughs> to keep the boys on the toes, I've got an enforcer. It's always embarrassing to be a human. The shit that we are jettisoning into the sea that is being washed up on shore is phenomenal. Taft manages to find a place. Let's have a look at them bad boys. One black one, one blue one. They're not the same colour, but they're the same make. 
They're the same no. make. <laughs> what more can you ask for? You can't ask anything else. Today, Len. Mate, they're not as good as mine. Look at them. That, they don't fit well, but fuck it, it's going to be doing me well on a Sunday night. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're going to say, the pair of high heel seals there for you to get lucky. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> After last night, Fletch. <laughs> <laughs> right, should we do this fishing line then? Yeah, let's go get some let's fish. Let's crack on. on. Four weeks after abandoning 13 British men on a remote desert island. I mean, that's almost like a honeymoon suite of a view. I went back to see for myself how they managed to survive. Welcome to Camp Basi, sir. Wow, do you mind if I have some of this? On a tropical desert island like this, dehydration is your biggest enemy. God, that's good. Without fluids, you're not going to last for more than three days. Yeah. That's what we've been drinking. Good, healthy stuff. Go, Filtered, boiled, Knock ready to out. drink. I mean, truly <laughs> horrible, isn't it? <laughs> it tastes like you've all been washing your socks in it. If the filter actually does, it is actually my socks. Mm, right. So you are drinking my sweat particles. Well, Enjoy that. <laughs> the only water source the men could find after a desperate search of the island was a stagnant pool. I never realised that I'd have to drink puddle water. When it came to collecting and transporting it, the debris from the beach came into its own. Calling it water is now a bit of a stretch of the imagination, to be honest. Sorry. And one of the problems of drinking from stagnant water is that the animals also drink from it. They do more than that, though. They also shit in it, and it's that that will make people sick. To make the water safe, the men improvised an ingenious filter system using materials they scavenged and repurposed. Stuff with, like Fletch said, his socks, charcoal, a little a grid to stop anything getting through, although towards the end we did have a very protein-filled water supply. Uh, insects yeah. and bugs and larvae and all of that. Yeah. <laughs> this was smart survival. Filtering the water before boiling removes any big particles that could contain life-threatening bugs. Looks like piss. Tastes a lot worse. Having established a water supply, the men's next priority was food. Is this where you keep your nets? Yeah, these are them here, so they're floating there. We're at low tide, so it should, it should be pretty quick. Finding these nets, repairing them and getting them into the sea was a lifeline for the men. When it comes to desert island survival, I always say to people, fish first. The sea as a larder is well stocked. All of the seas around here are literally teeming with life. There's something like 500 different edible species of fish, but it's also booby-trapped. Every time the men swam out to check their nets, they had to run the gauntlet with jellyfish, venomous stingrays and a whole host of other nasties. The waters were infested with sharks. We were seeing these great big fish, you know, with half of them eaten by the sharks, and we just didn't think anything of it. We just went out and swam with them. You never know what you're going to get. Look wow. at that. Yeah, good luck getting that one now. Even on my brief visit to the island, the men hauled in a potentially lethal catch. Stonefish are actually one of the most deadly fish in the sea. Well camouflaged, easy to stand on if you're not aware. Even if it doesn't kill you, people have been known to literally beg to have their feet amputated. The pain has been so intense. The island looked beautiful, but every time you went anywhere, it tried to kill you. And you're suddenly thinking, Jesus, this ain't a postcard. It's horrible. Before taking the guys into this extreme environment to start the experiment... If I leave and be, he will just quietly crawl around me. I gave them just one day's basic survival training. If they're big enough and you're small enough and one of these gets hold of you, it's going to squeeze you, I can feel that already on my hand, crush every bone in your body. So the truth is, none of these guys are experts, none of them are survival kind of gurus. You know, they're regular people and that's what we wanted. We didn't want the experts, we wanted normal people who have got to kind of improvise and think smart and be resourceful. Do you actually ever wipe your bum with leaves? I love wiping my bum with leaves. <laughs> Personally, if it was me, I'd get up in the morning, raise my arms aloft, wander into the sea, do my business, wipe my backside, salute as it floats out into the Grand Pacific. <laughs> you know, clean, done, hygienic. You wash your hands and you haven't got crap all over the island. 
So a bear doesn't shit in the woods, then? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I knew the biggest challenge for these guys was going to be finding enough food to keep them going. OK, scorpion. You'll find these under wood piles. You're out collecting firewood. Lift one up and bam. And it's not always obvious where those calories are going to come from. He'll strike you with his tail. See him doing it there? And he comes round, he bites you. Be a man, pin him down, take his stinger off. Good thing about these, though, they're good protein and you can eat them. Tastes like shit. <laughs> You're better off skewing them and roast them over the fire. But raw, they're horrible. Oh, hoo -hoo. scorpion. Here he is. There he is. There he is. There he is. Got, him. got him, got him. I've got him. He's aggressive. He's aggressive. From experience, I know it's amazing what you'll eat when you're pushed to the oh, edge. God, I can see its guts inside. That's not going to be tasty, guys. Come on, man, you're making us wait. Come on. We want to see you eat it. I hear that in, a, in the future, when things get a bit more dystopian, we're going to have to eat insects rather than mammals. So I'm looking forward to it. Arr, yes. That's man food. Man food. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks. How, how does that taste? Oh, yeah. it's food. <laughs> <laughs> oh. One of the key skills in the wild is knowing what you can eat and what you can't eat. And if there's doubt, don't take the risk. You'll only get it wrong once. More dangerous than any snake, scorpion or crocodile is this fella. Innocent looking little apple, actually called the death apple. And this is enough to kill not one man, but 20. And when you're surviving on an island, you're hungry, you see what you think is edible fruit, so tempting to pick it up, eat it. End game. Deaf apple, bloody deaf apple. That thing, m I was paranoid about deaf apple. But is that a deaf apple? Yeah. Yeah. Where's that come from? Where does that come from? It's been washing up. Yeah. Washed it's up? not here. It might be down there or up there. When you're walking on the beach, they wash up from elsewhere. If you step on that deaf apple, you're getting scabbed, you could die. And trust me, that deaf apple looked lovely. So we could have ate that and we would have died. From start to finish, the men were always teetering on the brink of starvation. And there goes my fucking bait. Just this bay is empty of life. All right. Come on, Mother Nature, give us some food. But what's important is that they never gave up. So where are we going, Sam? We're going foraging. And that is the key to survival. Look at the pigs. Ah, balls. Oh, fuck. We all tried so many different things and they just didn't work. We didn't realise how far mankind has come through trial and error. OK, here we go. He's coming shallow. Failure plus failure. <laughs> Plus determination equals success. Yes! Yes! Fuck it out! Yes! Hey, look at that big eight. Oh, mate! We've caught 28 fish yeah. today. Anyone for carbohydrate? Wow! Oh, oh my God! Driven by all-consuming hunger, <laughs> they went to extraordinary lengths to discover what the island had to offer. It's a fucking caiman! <laughs> Wow. I've never ate an orange before. Fuck off. We'll start now. Try that. Come on, here's your first one. Wow, you've got a massive hit of citrus all the way over here. It's nice, isn't it? So good. Welcome to the world of fruit, Dean. There was, however, one craving they couldn't easily satisfy, despite a tantalising reminder. Dean, what have, you, what have you found on the beach, mate? We found a, a sweet wrapper. It's intense for these guys, the lust just to get something sweet in their mouth. And the boys have found some of these and they had like a tiny little bit of sugar in them. But if you put a bit of boiling water in them... Are you good? Oh, oh, oh it's, good. it's good! It's oh. good! I don't care if he gives me the shit. <laughs> it's worth it. Over four weeks, these 13 men had come a long way since her first unappetising meal of snails. Oh, Mr Fletcher, an artist, uh, he tasted extra. some coconut there as well. Toasted coconut here, mate. Before departing, they invited me to sample some of their favourite hard-earned island delicacies. 
Unbelievable, guys. We have dressed crab, honey. Oh, you do not know how honoured you are to have that honey. Onto wow. your oysters there, which are just marinating at the moment in a, in a lime jus. We have fresh snapper there. We have gazuma berries and almonds in there, toasted coconut and a fig and lime marinade to go with your fish. Yep. Well, guys, I would like to, um, I'd like to say grace yeah. for eating. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, um, thank you for these men, the courage and the fortitude they've shown. Thank you for the hands that prepared this food and thank you for the sea that's provided it. Amen. 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 And let's try a bit of this. So a little bit of honey on the honey onto the oysters. A little I'd bit say. of honey on the oyster. That stuff is insane. I'm gonna tell you now. You look at the food that they serve for me, and there was a real sense of genuine pride in that. That it was um, it was really special. To go from you know scavenge, scavenging around in the first few days to providing something that you know I'm not saying it would it would be served at a Michelin star restaurant, but it was pretty good given the tools that we had. It showed our evolution and how much we'd got our stuff together. Oh, it's incredible. <laughs> it's off the scale. On that platter, that was like the culmination of our surviving there. It was a real sense of achievement. A toast to you guys, to an experience I, I, I really pray you'll never forget, uh, to an experience that I hope will empower you in your everyday lives and to friendships that I hope will last uh, all your days as well. Here, here. It's you guys. Here, here. Cheers. Four weeks ago, I abandoned 13 British men on a remote desert island they would have to fend for themselves in isolation. For me, it was really important that we didn't have camera crew coming in every day and filming it all, and it kind of just would have felt set up. I wanted this to be totally new, totally original, and never done before. For this reason, the radical decision was made to get the 13 men to film the entire experience for themselves. Come on, everybody. Take a walk with Uncle Saki today. The only filming is these guys going like that and going like that. Right, guys, I'm gonna have to put you down. I think I found us a bird. Yes, I have. Hang, hang, hang on, hang on. And effectively, that means the only people telling their story is themselves. Woohoo! Shazam! We're all photographers now. We've all got iPhones or smartphones yeah. or whatever. And you can shoot movies on these things. Yeah. You can take pictures. and. And we just do it as a natural part of our yep. life, so why not incorporate it in, into television? Yep. I'd like to show you around my favourite spot. This is where I come and sit when I feel a little bit shit. I tried to do this trip on a budget. I won this hat in Bulgaria about five years ago. Here's the sea. And these are my rocks. These are my rocks. Wang Rock. Way I'm out there. I bought my boots cheap, cheapest boots I could find. Look at this, day 13. What the fuck am I gonna do? Look at the view. Look at all this. This is the jungle that on which I have become a man. The group included a sound man and three trained and experienced cameramen who lived under exactly the same conditions as everybody else. It's a bit like Myself, Matt and Rupert and Kiff were uh, on a plane and it's crashed on a desert island. It just happens we had our gear with us. With danger never far away, the men needed to be able to deal with emergencies themselves. The hospital where people went for treatment. OK, so were you in charge? You were well, the assigned table. medic? Uh, yeah, between myself and Sam, um, we dealt with a few injuries. The men were provided with basic medical supplies. Craig was a trained first aider. I think I've done more first aid on the island than I do when I'm back home. <laughs> and Sam, a qualified doctor. You say, ah? Ah! He slipped as a frivet. I think it broke my hand. Without them, some men may have been forced to leave the island. I'll be honest, I punched the sand. Oh, no. <laughs> I enjoyed being the doctor on the island. Uh, it gave me a bit of, bit of a sense of purpose. 
So I've made this bamboo into a hopefully roughly the shape of a splint. I was called upon to do things I wouldn't normally do in my day-to-day -day life as a neurologist. I can still do some things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But the truth is that ultimately survival is about so much more than just physical preservation. As human beings, we're pretty complex creatures. You know, we need much more than just food and water. Uh, I think that's our base level, but above that, then we crave things like friendship and connection and community. The single hardest thing about that 28 days on that island, the lack of contact with your loved ones from the outside world. I'm 6,000 miles away from you, home, <laughs> and I'm missing here. The men had to get by with just one photo from home. My two grandkids, you're still with me, Toby and Annabelle. You'll be with me all the time. My beautiful girlfriend. And uh, a huge part of me wants to go home. I think the hardest thing was definitely missing my, my girlfriend and our little girl that we have together. That was heart-wrenching at times. It's just, it's just a whole yeah. no contact whatsoever. I mean, it, yeah. you keep, I keep thinking, I'll just snip off and use the phone and call home. Very, very suffocating feeling. It was important that the group reached out to each other to keep isolation at bay. What glues people together? Humour, kindness, and that shared adversity you're going through together. Yeah, I do. Oh, just there. Uh, come over a bit of motion weight, to be honest. Yeah? Yeah. You know what you need, don't you? Big Fletch hug. <laughs> yeah. You've got a temporary family at the moment, mate. Yeah, I know. Yeah? I know. I know. You've never met these people before in your life, but yet you become instantly close, just like that. As soon as you're chucked on the island, you're, you're best friends, because you've got no choice. I just feel like I've been so up and down. <sighs> you know what you need then, don't you? As well as a Fletch hug. What's that? You just man the fuck up, don't you? No, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Babe, I'm gay, I'm allowed to cry. <laughs> hey. But there were inevitable tensions and moments when it looked like the group might fall apart. Mate, come on, why are you here? Why are you here? No, I know. All right. Off. The wild exposes people wide open, and um, sometimes there's a lot of fallout and mess first. So all you want to do is bitch, and that's all. I'm not bitching. Hey, grow up! Don't walk away. When people are under pressure and your life is on the line, you've got to do all you can to keep a group cohesive and together. Because when it's together, it's strong. It's not strong when it's fragmented and broken. So what's going through your mind, Craig? Oh, I'm off. I'm off. I've had enough. Don't quit, mate. You'll regret it for the rest of your life if you do. Just keep plodding. Just digging deep. Yeah? You need to find, you need to find that fire in your belly, mate. In the end, all 13 men managed to stick it out together. Let the party begin! And on their last night, were able to celebrate their differences. The award for... the best... Tantrum. <laughs> oh, this one's close. This one's close one. Oh, it's tight. It's tight. It's a tight one. Is Craig. So the category for the most improved person, and this goes to Ryan. Yay! Five, five, Ryan. <laughs> I'm going to take this award and apply it for the rest of my life. Well done, mate. Well done, Ryan. Well done, Ryan. Well done, Ryan. I think it's powerful to see a group where people are so different, but they're actually bound together by shared experience. I think what you guys have been through is essentially an accelerated crash course in life. <laughs> and I'd love to find out what each of you is going to take away from the island, but also what you're going to leave on the island. You realise how little you can survive on here and how little you actually need, and it's, it's great to, I think, hopefully I'm going to be able to go home and just, like, pull that back and just be slightly less kind of wasteful with everything I do. I'm going to leave behind, hopefully forever, that sense of taking things for granted in the world that we live in. I don't feel as though I had a massive ego before, but if I did have any, I think I'll leave a bit more of it here. Mm.
I kind of started this whole experiment really to try and find out what everyday modern British blokes are actually like under pressure. And the reality is the experience has been bloody hard. I have huge respect for anyone who can come out of it the other end together as friends and with a smile on their face. <laughs> Mate, amazing! I just want to eat some food! And after any mission, there's nothing quite like the rewards. I've been thinking about that bar for days now, mate, and that is what I'm going to do now. When we first got back to civilization, we were given rules about what we should and shouldn't eat. So we were told to stay away from carbs, beer, and all these things. And the first thing we managed to get our hands on... One, two, two three... Oh. Oh. Beer. <laughs> yeah! 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 Holy God! Oh, man, do I like beer now? It was quite an achievement. I think we were all proud to have done it. And that cold beer. Hug it out, hug it out. That was. That showed we had somehow. After weeks of being cut off from home, first contact can be overwhelming. Hello. Hiya, Mum. Hello. Hiya, Jim. It's hard to explain what we've just done in a phone call. Well, where do you begin? We just got off, Mum. We've just, uh, just landed. Baby? <laughs> Are you there? <laughs> Four weeks' worth of no contact, four weeks' worth of missing, all just came out. Dad! Hi, I'm done I'm done I'm finished. I'm back uh, from the island, love. I just want to speak to you. I lost two stone. Two stone? Yeah. I just want to see you. Yeah. Feeling these things makes you feel really fucking alive. There's no doubt, I think, when you go through hard times, there's pain first. But this is about what people find at the end of it. Yes! Energy is coming back! Returning from the wild always helps you see modern life through fresh eyes. That's the women's correct. What do the symbols mean? Ah, <laughs> <sighs> freedom. It's fucking incredible. Simplest things like taking a loo in a toilet, as opposed to running to find a tree that's far enough away from camp. Oh, my God. Problem solved. Oh, I can just feel the cool air. This doesn't feel right. Oh, wow. Nothing left of me. God, that's very weird. <laughs> Nobody had to fetch it. I'll filter it. I'll boil it. Oh, man. Oh. You, you do take it for granted. I'm not going to take it for granted anymore. And the magic is you can't buy those things. It comes at a cost, and the cost is that thousand barrels of sweat and toil. And I've been there many times. The hardship is always worth it. And no food ever tastes as good as that first meal. Oh, my God! Calm down, Sam. Calm down, mate. Chicken! This is sugar. This is, this is sugar. Your senses are almost like, they, they, they almost shut down. They're not being exercised. So the second that you have something which you haven't had for a month, you times its flavor by a thousand. Oh my God. Oh my God, more sugar. More sugar. <laughs> more <laughs> sugar. <laughs> you taste so fucking good. The best food. I take immense pleasure when someone says that the hungry are the starving now in normal life, saying that you don't even know what hunger is, because it is very different 
to your standard space between dinner and tea. Three, two, one. And the tomato sauce absolutely blew your mind. It was that strong. Oh, it's just like a pure explosion of flavours in your mouth. It, it tastes magical. To food. Our old friend, she's back again. For 13 men, a life-changing experience. And one which they deserve to remember with an enduring sense of pride. Whoever you are, whatever shape you are, whatever upbringing you have, actually, when squeezed, these guys have proved modern British man has actually got what it takes.